Hi there. My name is Robin Oaks. I go by she and they pronouns, and I have identified as bisexual for 43 years. And yes, you did hear that correctly. I said 43 years. I like to tell people this because there are still so many people out there who believe that bisexuality is just a phase. And so I like to introduce myself as Exhibit A to demonstrate that for many of us, bisexuality is actually an enduring identity. For me, it's one that's lasted since my very first month of college. And that's, that's how I identified then, and that's how I still identify now. This program is called Bi Plus Youth, Challenging Stigma and Reducing Disparities. So thanks for showing up for this program. I'm hoping that by the end of the session, you'll have some useful information and tools about the experience of young people with non-binary sexualities that will help you support them in your work. So this is a program geared toward professionals, and I'm fully aware that there are probably some people watching this program who know a whole lot about some or all of the topics I'll be discussing. Um, for this reason and others, I truly wish we were all in the same room in, together so that we could actually have a conversation. My programs are usually quite interactive and I'm not used to pre-recording, so please bear with me. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to jump into PowerPoint now and stay there. So who are we talking about today? We are definitely including youth who self-identify with the word bisexual, but it's important to keep in mind that there are so many different labels used by young people who identify as being attracted to people of more than one gender. And if some of these labels are familiar to most of us like pansexual or queer or fluid or questioning. Um, and then there are a wide range of other labels as well. As a speaker, I try to be very inclusive in my language and also economical, and I often struggle with, with kind of a, an umbrella term to use to describe this vast array of identities. Sometimes, and probably most often, I use the term by plus. Um, it's important to keep in mind that when I use the term by plus, that plus is real. That plus is intended to indicate, to act as a place marker for the many, many other identities. Um, and I'm very clear that every one of those identities is the best identity for some people, and that different identities are the best identity for different people. Um, sometimes I use the term non-binary sexualities, um, multi-sexualities, middle sexualities, but whichever term I use, I'm referring to a constellation of identities that occupy the space both between and outside of the binary identities of gay or straight. Here's a little bit of population data. How are youth identifying? So the Trevor Project has a, 19, a 2019 report that asked that very question. And what they found was that 45% of the respondents self-identified as gay, um, one third as bisexual, and 21% use some other word. In addition, they noted that there were also a good number of youth who use more than one label simultaneously or who hyphenated a string of labels to describe themselves. HRC also asked this question and what they found again was a wide range of labels with the most common being gay or lesbian, then bisexual, then pansexual, and then asexual. Um, they also found in their survey that one third of their respondents self-identified as transgender, meaning transgender or non-binary as compared to cisgender. And this is also, I think, a very important trend to keep in mind, um, especially when we think about sexual orientation, historically sexual orientation has been our gender compared to the gender of the person or people to whom we are attracted. And when you complicate the category of gender, 
it does all kinds of interesting things to the topic of sexual orientation. And for example, when I first identified as bisexual, I thought bisexual meant being attracted to men or women and, or men and women. And then, then the gender binary got exploded and I came to learn that there were many, you know, many different gender identities. And so I had to repurpose my definition of bisexual so that the bi and bisexual for me now means attracted to my own gender and different gender or genders. So similar different is now how I've repurposed the first two letters of the word bisexual. And so that, that, I think that the, inter, the interaction of gender identity and sexual orientation is fascinating. So here's some adult data. Um, the question often gets asked, what percentage of the population identifies as LGBT? Um, I would venture to say that we really don't know the answer to that. We are still part of a culture that is so uncomfortable with the whole topic of sexuality. And it's not a stretch to imagine that many people receiving a telephone call at their home on their personal phone might not answer that question honestly. And furthermore, there is not a tight correlation between identity and behavior. So I would speculate that the numbers are much higher than anything that, that this type of research will show us. Um, but there are some things that we can infer and learn from, from looking at the data that does exist out there. Um, so this is Gallup data. They telephone surveyed 340,604 adults and they did the, they included among their questions, do you personally identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender? Um, in 2012, the first year they answered that question, they asked that question, 3.5% of the respondents said yes. By 2017, the number had gone up to 4.5%, a full 30% increase. When you break this same data down by, by age, you find out something interesting. The younger you are, the less straight you're likely to be. And this is true of every succeeding generation. And in fact, millennials started off in 2012 at 5.8% said yes. By 2017, the number was up to 8.2%. 8 and in fact, they own that entire 30% increase. That is all thanks to millennials. So what about youth? Um, the CDC, every year, the Center for Disease Control does a survey every two years of high school age students in the United States. It's done through representative sampling, so they select certain schools that demographically reflect the United States. And in 2015, for the very first time, they succeeded in getting a sexual orientation question added to the survey. Um, this was a very big deal. I have no doubt that there were many people who didn't think this question belonged on the survey, who, who thought that if you tell young people, if you ask young people about their sexual orientation, they're all gonna turn gay and start having gay sex. Um, who knows what they were thinking? Um, maybe they were thinking that if you don't ask this question, young people won't think about this topic. Um, I don't know, that makes me giggle. Um, anyway, they asked a question for the first time in 2015, and the question that they asked was, which of the following best describes you? A, heterosexual, parentheses straight. B, gay or lesbian. C, bisexual. D, not sure. I showed this question to a dear friend of mine who came out as bisexual when he was 12. Um, when I asked him this question, he was 13. I showed, I showed him this survey. I put it down in front of him and I said, so what do you think of this question? And he looked down and he said, where are all the other words? And I said, mm-hmm. And he said, and why do they explain heterosexual but they don't explain the other words? And I said, I love you. And he looked down again and he said, and why did they put heterosexual first? And I said, I love you more. And it was so, I think when I show this, this survey to young people, it's apparent to them that this is a problematic question. And 
I think the reason that they keep on using questions like this is that they want to be able to compare apples to apples over time. And if you change the wording of the survey, you can't do that anymore. But the downside of that, of course, is that if you ask a limited question, you may not actually find out exactly how young people are identifying. Anyway, 2015, here's what they found. 89% is heterosexual, 2% self-reported as gay or lesbian, 6% as bisexual, 3.2% as unsure. Two years later, same question on a new survey with a new group of young people. The number of young people identified as heterosexual went down, and gay, lesbian, and unsure went up about 10%. Bisexual went up by a full third. So this is, again, a trend we can see over time. And then there's Harvard University. Um, and the reason I include Harvard is not because I believe Harvard is the be-all, end-all. It's because Harvard, every year, the Harvard Crimson, which is their undergraduate newspaper, does a survey of all of their incoming first-year students, and then they publish the results. So in 2007, the Harvard Crimson added a sexual orientation question to its survey, and the first time they asked this question, 2.5% of the respondents self-identified as bisexual. Last year, the number had jumped almost threefold to 7.2%. Meanwhile, at Yale, which also does a survey of its incoming first years, they found that 14% of their incoming first year students identified as bisexual compared to 7.2% at Harvard. Go Yale. Now, if you ask people a different question, instead of saying, what are you? What if you asked people, where are you? If you asked them to locate themselves on a sexuality continuum, and YouGov did just this in an internet survey. And here's what they found. And this is a, this is a graph broken out by age cohort again. Uh, for people 55 and above, 84% put themselves on the straightest edge of the survey, 7% at the gayest edge of the survey, and only 7% on all the other five numbers combined. When you go and look at millennials, the 18 to 34 year olds, you see a very different picture. Only 55% of respondents put themselves at the straightest edge of the survey. That's, that's a 29% drop. And a full third of respondents put themselves in the five middle numbers. What kind of experience are BIPLUS youth having? The Human Rights Campaign did a study in 2018 of over 14,000 sexual minority youth, and what they found was that bi-plus youth are less likely than their lesbian and gay counterparts to be out to their teachers, to their parents, and to their LGBTQ plus friends. They also found that in many ways, um, bi plus youth have similar experiences to lesbian and gay youth. In some aspects, their experience is a little bit more difficult and others a little bit less. Um, they found that on a 1 to 10 scale, 87% of bi plus youth rate their average level of stress as 5 or higher. And that's 10% higher than lesbian and gay identified youth. 81% of bi plus youth said that they usually feel down and depressed over the past week um, compared to 71% of lesbian and gay identified youth. And this is counter to the um, prevailing narrative that bi plus youth don't experience oppression, that they have it easy, that they just have the option to pass. Um, the reality is, and all the data is showing, that bi plus youth experience significant, significant oppression and stress. Um, for example, um, this is data from the CDC study. Um, one of the questions asked, the, the study asks a bunch of demographic questions 
and it also asks um, behavioral questions. And it has a few questions on suicidality. Um, one question was, have you seriously considered attempting suicide during the 12 months before completing the survey? And of all youth, 17.7% said yes. I find these, this number extremely disturbing and high, and it tells me that youth in general are having a very, very hard time. Now, when you break it out by sexual orientation, here's what you find. The number on the left is all youth. The number on the, in the center is heterosexual identified youth. And the number on the right is LGB youth. Quick aside, it's LGB and not LGBT because the survey does not ask young people about their gender identity. Um, the word that I heard was that they were working on a question to add to the 2017 version of this survey and something happened in 2016, yes, the election, and that question was never added. So we don't have this data from this source on the experience of trans youth. Now, when you break out the data even further, if you disaggregate bisexual from lesbian and gay, you find that bi plus youth are having a really, really hard time and that their suicidality level is, is extremely high. And here I'll, I'll interject that trans youth have the most disturbing data of all. Um, there was one study that showed 40.6% of trans youth had considered attempting suicide. Um, from the CDC's own data from different sources, um, they found that 35% of the transgender youth have attempted suicide, which is different from considering it. Now, in my work, I'm always looking for tools and concepts that help me make sense of what I'm seeing, make sense of um, the data, make sense of what I'm experiencing. Um, it would be very easy for some people, and in fact, I've seen people do this, to say, oh, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people have higher rates of suicidality. That's because being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender is a problem, or a flaw, or a character defect. So of course they're having a hard time. Um, but I don't think that's what's going on at all. I believe that our sexual orientations and our gender identities are neutral things and they are not in and of themselves stressful. Um, the stress doesn't come from who we are, but rather from where we are. Um, so minority stress is the concept that stigma, external stigma, prejudice, and discrimination create a hostile and stressful social environment which cause us stress. And that stress can create mental health issues and affect, have, negative, have a negative impact on our behavior and performance. Um, and I find this term, this concept extremely helpful because one of the ways that oppression works is that we t often internalize our own oppression and we feel that somehow we're responsible for causing it. And I don't believe that at all anymore. I really believe that the problem is external and therefore the solution to minority stress is that we need to change our external environment. We don't need to change ourselves. I believe strongly that you can not talk about identity in any kind of intelligent way without doing so through an intersectional lens. So it's important to keep in mind when talking about minority stress and talking about the experience of bi plus youth, that each of us has multiple identities. We are not just our sexual orientations and that there are many of us who have multiple identities that carry stigma and therefore each person experiences minority stress and oppression in a complex, layered, and nuanced way and there is no singular experience of oppression. In my live programs on bisexuality, 
I usually invite audience members to help me generate a list of commonly held beliefs or stereotypes about bisexuality and about bi plus people. It has been my experience that people have no trouble at all coming up with a very, very long list of stereotypes. Here are a few. The idea that bisexuality is just a phase, um, that all bisexual people are promiscuous, that we're confused, that we don't exist, that we can't be happy with just one person, that um, women who say they're bi are just trying to be trendy, that men who say they're bi are really gay and afraid to admit it. Um, after that, I have, um, I, I share with the audience five frames that I have that I think help explain where these stereotypes come from. It's my thesis that these stereotypes are not actually caused by bisexual or bi plus people, but rather by limitations in other people's perception. Um, I'm going to share just three of them with you right now, um, briefly. One of them is binary thinking. We are part of a culture that is extremely binary in the way it thinks. Um, when you think about it, for example, when most people think about race, they think of black and white, which makes no sense at all when, you know, when you really think about it, because of course, you know, there's more than two categories to start with, and there are people who are multi and biracial, but yet race, black, white. Politics, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, red state, blue state. Um, you know, this is how, this is how we think. Um, the gender binary, man, woman. Um, you know, one of the things that I hope is becoming clearer to more people in mainstream America is that gender is much more complicated than that. But what this does for me is it helps me understand that when people erase bisexuality, when people think in terms of gay and straight, when people assume that everyone is either gay or straight, that it's actually not an act designed to hurt that individual person. When that happens to me, people aren't trying to hurt me, um, nor are they trying to hurt all bisexual people. What they're doing is simply thinking in binary ways, and that has the result of erasing my identity, but it's not intended to be a harmful act. And so that's thing number one. Um, thing number two is ignorance. I usually ask people to raise their hand if they got a great education about LGBTQ plus people through their high school curriculum. And when I ask that, almost everybody in the room laughs and and occasionally a couple of people will raise their hand, but usually they had some sort of special alternative schooling. Um, but most people in the room, you know, say, nope, not me. And this helps me remember that when people say ignorant things, it's not necessarily because they're trying to be hurtful to me. Um, most people who say things that are hurtful to me probably don't even realize that the things they're saying are causing me, causing me harm. Um, and I share this because this has helped me become a much less angry person. And you know, just remembering that it's not about me, it's about them. Um, and then the third one I want to share with you is oftentimes within the LGBTQ plus community, and you'll see this a lot in youth groups, people will be mean toward each other. You'll see lesbian or gay youth. Um, making fun of or dismissing the experience of bi youth. You'll see um, trans and non-binary youth sometimes going at it. You'll see bi and pan youth arguing over which one of those words every single person should use. Um, this plays out a lot in a lot of different ways within, within the LGBTQ plus community. And to that, I just try to remember that hurt people hurt people. You know, there's a concept in sociology of horizontal hostility or horizontal oppression, which is that people who are experiencing 
the pain and discomfort of oppression too often take out that discomfort horizontally on one another. And again, it doesn't excuse bad behavior, but it explains it. And I have these three concepts and two others, and I believe that my five concepts together can help explain all of these stereotypes. And they also serve as a protective factor for bi plus people because when somebody says something ignorant to me, instead of feeling like I'm being pierced with a sword, I can think, what is that person doing? You know, are they, are they thinking in binaries? You know, what's going on here? And so, for example, if somebody says, um, you know, bisexuality is just a phase, it's a transitional phase, or it doesn't exist, I can think, oh, that's binary thinking. And for me, that serves as a shield or a protective force against, um, against having those stereotypes hurt me as directly as they would if I didn't have those tools. And so I often share these, share these with youth, and I find it extremely helpful. Because again, when someone says something, I just think, what are you doing? Instead of you know, focusing on, on taking that in and internalizing it and personalizing it. So moving on, it's interesting. Um, Bi plus people have unique disparities. We don't have the same exact experience as lesbian and gay people. I do believe that there's a strong overlap in our experience, but it's not exactly the same. So one question that I have is, what are unique challenges facing bi plus people? And what do we experience that's different from the experiences of lesbian and gay people? And here are some of the things I've come up with. Um, in addition to the crushing wave of negative stereotypes, um, bi plus people are told that it's easy to identify as bi, and that ours is not a serious or political identity. Um, when I'm told it's easy to identify as bi, and yet I'm experiencing minority stress and I'm experiencing discomfort, that it feels to me like a form of gaslighting. Like someone, and having, if you're experiencing someone and other people are saying, well, you're not experiencing that, for me, that augments the discomfort. It makes me feel even more uncomfortable. If I'm feeling pain and people are saying no, that makes me feel even more pain. Um, being told that bisexuality is not a serious or political identity, that is very hurtful to me as well. Um, I believe that holding non-binary space of any kind is extremely political and extremely serious. Um, that bi plus folks have a hard time, harder time finding communities and safe spaces. There is research showing that bi plus youth are less tied in with community. They're less likely to be able to identify a supportive adult. They're they're just they don't have the same same resource base as lesbian and gay youth. And even when they're in LGBTQ plus spaces they may not feel that they fully belong. They may feel that sense of liminality or of being in the borderlands or am I gay enough to be here? Will other people think I'm gay enough to be here? Um, another challenge is that we are more invisible and rarely well represented. You can't, there, there are precious few positive representations of bi plus people on television, in the media, in film. Um, it's starting to get a little bit better, but it's still, there are far fewer positive images of, les of bisexual people than there are of lesbian and gay people. Um, and then bi plus people challenge people's urge to put things into simple binaries. And I know that sometimes people just start squirming when they have to deal with my identity because they want things to be simple. And so it can feel like a pretty heavy lift to have to constantly hold and affirm 
my BIPLUS identity. And then the fact that our very existence is subject to debate, to have to listen to people say, I don't believe in bisexuality, or you say I'm bisexual and they say, no, you're not, or I don't believe in that, like, that is exhausting. That is absolutely exhausting. So it's onward toward the end. Another challenge of identifying as bisexual is that people don't really have a clear definition of what that means or that their definition of bisexual might be very different from mine. So this is my definition of bisexuality. And if you Google definition of bisexuality, this is one that will probably come up on page one of your search screen. I call myself bisexual because I acknowledge in myself the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one sex or gender, not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. So this is my definition of bisexuality, and it's one that is expansive, that can hold a lot. I get so many messages from people saying that when I saw your definition of bisexuality, I finally felt comfortable in my identity. So one thing that you can do if you want to support BIPLUS students is just put out you know, expansive definitions of bisexuality like this one. And I'm often asked, why does it matter? Why do you need to tell people about this? For me, claiming a bisexual identity is a way of claiming my entire self, my entire experience, past, present, future, potential, internal, external, rather than being defined by a specific relationship at a specific moment in my life. I came out as bi when I was 18, um, and I didn't tell anybody else or act on it until I was 23. I was most definitely bisexual during those five years. In my, from age 23 to 30, I was a practicing bisexual person. I actually got a lot of practice. I engaged in serial monogamy. I was in several relationships over that period of time. Um, and I was bisexual then. When I was 30, I actually had my heart broken and I took a six year break from relationships. And I was bisexual during those six years too. And then when I was 36, I met my wife, I met Peg. And we've been together now, we are now in season 23 of our rom-com. And I'm still just as bisexual as I was when I was 18, 23, 30, 36, because for me, bisexuality is how I understand myself. It's my sense of myself, and it's not dependent on a specific um, act or behavior or relationship. It's really about me, not about what I'm doing at any point or moment in my life. So what can we do to support Bi Plus Youth? I made up a short list. Um, I'm hoping that you will make up a much longer list. To-do list. One thing you can do is review your website and your printed materials and make sure that the stuff that you have up there is fully inclusive in language and representation. For example, include images of young people wearing bi and pan pride flags. Um, include images of bi and pan pride flags. If you're doing any, any kind of personal stories or narratives, make sure that some of those stories include by plus people. Um, offer specific programming directed to by plus youth. This is, despite the fact that by plus youth are such a large percentage of the LGBTQ plus community, there's not that much programming directed directly toward us. So I think programming that is about us is really important. I also think it's important to make sure that lesbian and gay youth and other sexual minority youth show up to that programming because it's been my experience that sometimes when we have programming like that, just the bi plus youth show up. And that's, I think, in order to change the entire culture, we need to reach all, all of our youth. Um, 
make it abundantly clear in any way you can think that BIPLUS youth are welcome. So many BIPLUS youth are struggling with the question, am I, do I belong here? Am I, again, am I gay enough to be here? Is this place really for me? So anything you can do to counter that narrative is really, really important. Um, interrupt binary thinking and biphobia and bi erasure and other microaggressions when they occur between youth because they do and they will. So don't, don't let things slide. If somebody says something disparaging about bi plus youth, interrupt it. Um, make sure that you have out bi plus role models, staff, volunteers, um, youth leaders. Make sure that you have some of those, that some of those folks are out bi plus people. Um, young people need to see representations of themselves. I've had numerous young people say to me that I was the first adult bisexual person that they ever met. They need to see us. And again, we need to say that specifically because, again, because of the tip of the iceberg dynamic, it may be that some of the people right there in front of them are also bi plus, but they may not know that. So we need to say it. We need to be visible. We need to you know, really make ourselves seen. Um, another thing is just don't assume people's sexual orientations or gender identities. A girl with a girlfriend is not necessarily a lesbian, and like, we need to create a culture that doesn't jump to that binary conclusion. Um, and then this is something that I try to hold in my mind. Just remember that today's youth are growing up in a different, different historical moment than we did and that their experience is profoundly different from ours. And that in itself would be a really long discussion because it's, it's true in so many ways from their access to information, um, which can be both a blessing and a curse, to representation. They have many more role models and representations than we did. They have a very different vocabulary and language than we had. Just to always remember not to impose our own experience on them. Um, here are a few resources and references. I guess you can just maybe take a screenshot. And finally, this is my contact info. I hope that you will also take a screenshot or a photo of this. Um, if you have any thoughts, feedback, suggestions, I welcome them. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, thank you again for coming to this program. I hope it's been helpful. And what I will end with is just saying bye.